All right, you guys, as you can see by the thumbnail, I'm back with another one like the other one. Not that one, but this one. And I'm going to get straight into it because I want to get these stories out to you guys by tonight. I got three stories. If I can get through at least two of them, it'll be a major accomplishment. It's Sunday. It's late. I'm pissed off. My Niners got whooped again. How many times have we lost now? Four times? Three in a row? Anyways, I also know that there's a lot of you guys that are waiting for that early morning Monday banger so that, you know, when you're doing your commute or you're out there doing your deliveries, you have something to listen to. You guys got something in the chamber early, ready to go in the morning. Hopefully, I'll be able to come through for you guys. Hopefully, I'll be able to accommodate. Anyways, this story right here is about a family that I've talked a lot about. I've told you guys several stories about this family. I'm sure you guys have heard other stories from other YouTubers, you know, it's about one of those families that are deeply involved in the gang culture. And we all got them from our neighborhoods. We all know families that everybody's involved. Sister, cousin, aunt, uncle, mother, father, cat, bird, dog, the whole family's involved from the time they were in diapers all the way up until when they get to prison. The Mexican mafia has several families like this that all got involved in that organization. One of them gets involved, a brother, then his brother gets involved, like the Aguirre's. You got the Aguirre's, you got the Grajeda's, you got the Moreno's. This story right here is about the Grajeda's. It's more so about Cherio from La Rana and Peanut from Westside Wimas. And there's a lot of moving parts in this story, as there always is when you're talking about the Grajeda's. But it's about how Peanut picked up that 62 years to life sentence that he's serving right now. Now, this incident, it took place at a prominent motel that's located in an area that's claimed by Westside Wimas. This motel called the Wilmington Inn is the type of rundown motel, one of those seedy type of hotels where there's always something going on at all hours of the day and night. I'm talking about there's always something happening there in the hallway, up on the rooftop, behind the dumpster, down the street, in the parking lot. Somebody's always getting beat up, stabbed, shot. The cops are always being called out there. Domestic violence disputes. It's one of those hotels. Shit is all the way live from the morning until night. And this night was no different. You know, it's the type of hotel, with all due respect, that, you know, most of the time these type of seedy hotels are managed and operated by a Middle Eastern family. And they'll let you rent a room for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, a half a day, however long you want to rent that room for. All they worry about is making their money. A lot of the times you'll have tricks that will go to these type of hotels. They'll bring a prostitute in there. They'll do their thing for 15, 20 minutes, and then they'll bounce out. So it's one of those type of hotels. It's the type of hotel where you walk through the hallways and you'll see people shooting dope, people in the bathroom shooting dope, people fighting in the hallways, people walking from room to room. They come from one room, grab the Brillo pads. They go to another room, grab the baking soda. You'll walk down the hallway and a lot of the times the doors will be cracked open. So you'll, you'll catch a glimpse of somebody nodding out, somebody over here shooting dope, somebody over here doing their thing. You know what I'm saying? It's one of those crazy type of hotels that we all have seen at one point in time. So in order for you guys to understand how this fatal conflict, how it escalated, you guys need to understand the dynamics of what's involved first. So you got East Side We Must and you got West Side We Must. They're two different neighborhoods. You would think that this is one big hood that stands together, but they're actually mortal enemies. And they've been involved in an ongoing rivalry for a long time. Usually when these guys see each other, it's go time. It's on site, barring some type of exception. A lot of the times when you have these type of, you know, neighborhoods that are that closely associated, west side and east side, you'll have cousins that might be from the east side, and then you'll have cousins that will be from the west side. Or you'll be involved with somebody in a relationship, and by, you know, by marriage or something, somebody's, somebody's involved or somebody knows each other. So unless, you know, it's a situation like that, where you see a cousin or a family member, you're not gonna you're not gonna bring no harm to somebody like that. You're gonna give them a pass and keep it pushing. Other than that, if they run into each other out there, they usually go at each other. The other crazy thing about East Side We Must and West Side We Must is that East Side wears the color red to signify its allegiance to its gang. 
West Side wears the color blue to signify its allegiance to its gang. And it's got nothing to do with North and South. These guys don't know what a North Daniel is. A lot of them haven't even seen North Daniels until they go to prison. This is just about, you know, the color that they wear that represents their hood. You know, it's a trip because I, I never knew that, that there was that many hoods from Southern California, L.A., San Diego, that had neighborhoods that wore the color red. There were Sureños, but there is. And there's actually, there's a lot of 49er fans out there as well. So let's fast forward now to November 29th, 2010. There's a female by the name of Anadina Torres that is the sister of Pina Grajeda. This is Pina's sister, Anadina Torres. She's living at the Wilmington Inn with her boyfriend, Bugsy, a guy from Eastside We Must. He just so happens to be from Eastside We Must. And this is the, the kind of situation I'm talking about. So Anadina is closely associated with Westside because she was involved in a prior relationship where, you know, she got to know a lot of Westside members and she had family that was from Westside We Must. On the other hand, her boyfriend, Bugsy, he's from Eastside We Must. And Bugsy is the type of individual, he's not a banger. There's a difference between a banger, a gang banger, and a gang member. Bugsy's a gang member. He's somebody that he wears, you know, he wears the color red to represent Eastside We Must. He's out there in the neighborhood. He passes through, but he's not out there banging. He's not the type of individual that's driving around the neighborhood, you know, securing the perimeter, looking for enemies, jumping out on cats, asking them, where you from? He's not that type of individual. He's just an Eastside We Must gang member that will represent his hood, but he really don't want no problems. He's not built like that. But at this time, on November 29, 2010, you know, at that time, in Adenema and Bugsy, they're living at that hotel. They're living there at the Wilmington Inn. They got a room there. They're playing house. They got a little hot pot. They got a, a portable fridge, a pantry full of that government cheese, peanut butter, all that good stuff. You guys know that you've all stood in line at those, what are they, food banks? and you've gotten some of that government food. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. And when you ain't got no money, you're on welfare, that shit is. Anyway, so, you know, they're living there at the Wilmington Inn at this time. And apparently the day before this incident, Enedema got into a car accident and she didn't go to the hospital. She decided at that time she wasn't gonna go to the hospital. She just, she left the scene and went home. But, you know, the next day, her leg swells up. It's obviously infected. So she tells Bugsy, she's like, man, my leg's fucked up. I'm in a lot of pain. I need to go to the hospital. I got to get my leg checked out. So that's what they do. They leave their room that night, and they're on their way to the hospital. Now, being that Enedema is Pina's sister, obviously, you know, Cuate, Wino, and Cherio are her uncles. So they call Cherio. She calls Cherio and she's like, hey, you know what? I need I need a ride to the hospital. My leg's fucked up, Theo. She's like, you know, can you come pick me up? You know, she doesn't want to do the Uber thing. They're not about to catch the bus. And he's like, yeah, you know what? I'm like 15 minutes away. I'll come pick you guys up. It's good. So that's the plan. They leave their room and, you know, they go towards the front of the hotel. There's a little spot right there by the front entrance where they're gonna post up and just wait for them. It's kind of like a balcony area out in front of the, the hotel. So as they're walking through the hallway, they're seeing other people doing their thing at the hotel that night. And, you know, Bugsy, he's got on a red shirt. He's got a red shirt on and he probably figures, you know what? I'm not disrespecting nobody. It's probably cool for me to wear a red shirt. Plus, you know, I'm with an edema. You know, they all know her. They all know her from 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 the West Side. So, you know, I should be cool. And I'm not I'm not really disrespecting anybody anyways. So, you know, he leaves the room wearing his red shirt. On the night of this incident, there was another individual that was there at the hotel named Johnny Carball. But Johnny Carball, he was the type of individual that had grown up around West Side Weemaz gang members all his life. And he was deeply entrenched in the gang culture. He was a gang banger. He's somebody that was out there, you know, manning the, the, the perimeters, looking out for, for, you know, enemies. You know, he was somebody that was really into, you know, West Side We Must. He banged that shit. He ate it, slept it, walked it, talked it. 
So, you know, he's the type of individual that if if he seen you and you were from East Side, we must, he confronted you, it was on. And his mom was also living at that hotel as well. Her name was Stella. Stella was with another guy named Psycho from 18th Street. So these are most of the people that are there at that hotel the night that this incident took place. But Stella, you know, Stella, she was the type of, of female that, you know, she raised her son, Johnny Carbajal, to be a gang member. From the time he was 10, 11, 12, like most of us got involved at around 10 or 11, 12, she would bring guys by from, you know, West Side Wemas, guys that are coming out of prison. She would have relationships with these dudes and Johnny would see him. And he started taking notice that these guys were from the West Side. So that's kind of how he got involved in gangs. His mom basically introduced him to, to gangs. You know, the other thing about Anadina, Pina's sister, is that she was the type of female that she loved her family. And she was always dropping their names. She was proud of who her family was. She was the type of female that let everybody and their mother know that Cherio, Wino, and Cuate were her tios. And that Pina was her brother. And a lot of the people that lived at the hotel, she let them know as well that, you know, those were her relatives. She was name dropping, you know, as a way to not only give her a little bit of credibility, but also just to use their name as a form of protection. Don't fuck with me. You know who my family is. Psycho had done time in prison. He knew who Cherio was. He had done time with him in prison. And even though he knew that, you know, that this was Anadina's uncles, he kept his distance from her because he knew that she was the type of female that would get you caught up. If you end up getting caught up with her, obviously you're going to end up having problems with the Grahadas, her family. So he just kept kept his distance from her. So on the night of the incident, Anadina and her boyfriend Bugsy were walking through one of the hallways at the Wilmington Inn and Bugsy was flamed up. He was wearing a red shirt representing his affiliation with Isai Wimas. But he wasn't doing it to disrespect anybody. Like I said, Bugsy wasn't a gang banger. Bugsy was a gang member. You know, he was just representing his his color. And he probably figured, you know what? I'm with my lady. She knows a lot of these guys from the West Side. They're probably not going to fuck with me. No harm, no foul. And he really wasn't looking to get into any trouble. He wasn't trying to look for no trouble with these guys. He wasn't trying to get into any kind of conflict. All he wanted to do was bring his lady to the hospital, get her to the hospital. She's in a lot of pain, and that's all he really cared about. But as they're walking through the hallway... Eventually, at some point, they're approached by several West Side We Must gang members. They see Bugsy wearing a red shirt and they jam him up. Hey, homie, hey, where you from, bro? You know, Bugsy, he responds like he normally responds when he gets jammed up like that. He doesn't want no conflict. He isn't about to be like, hey, puro, puro we Side We Must. He doesn't respond like that. He's like, hey, homie, he's like, you know, no disrespect. I'm from the East Side, but. You know, I'm 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 not trying to disrespect nobody, man. I'm from the east side, you know. So these guys, some of them knew who Enedema was, some of them didn't. They're youngsters. So they end up telling Bugsy, take your shirt. They're like, you know what, just take your shirt off, bro. You can't be you can't be wearing your shirt in our hood. This is our hood right here. That's disrespectful. You know what I mean? So, you know, Bugsy, he doesn't trip. He's like, you know what, fuck it. Hey, you know, he even apologizes, like, my bad. You know, I'm not trying to disrespect nobody. I'm just trying to bring my lady to the hospital. So he takes his shirt off. So they're posted up. They're waiting. They're waiting for Chirio to show up. And, you know, there's there's a bunch of junk and shit in the hallway. There's a couple of wheelchairs. So, you know, any demon, she doesn't want to stand up. Her legs fucked up. She wants to sit down. So she sees a wheelchair sitting right there. She sits in the wheelchair. And this is when all this is happening. She took it upon herself to sit right there in the wheelchair. It was like, nobody's going to really trip. It's sitting out in the hallway. It looks like a piece of junk. Fuck it. Nobody's nobody's going to trip on it. So she she takes a seat. So when all this is taking place, when they're jamming up Bugsy about taking his shirt off, the main one that's, that's jamming up Bugsy is Johnny Carball. And although there's several West Side We Must gang members standing there, Johnny's the one that's doing most of the talking. So, again, you know, Bugsy takes his, his shirt off. And Adina, she doesn't say nothing because she doesn't know a lot of these guys. A lot of them are youngsters. She's in pain. She, she doesn't want to deal with this shit anyway. But when, you know, when Johnny tells Bugsy, he's like, you know what, man? Fucking put that shit in the bag. I don't even want to see that shit. This is when Adina speaks up. But, 
you know, Adina speaks up when Johnny tells him, you know what, put it in a bag, bro. Put that shit in a bag. I don't even want to see that shit. Now she speaks up because she feels like Johnny's going too far, like he's being a bully. So she tells him, she's like, hey, man, why don't you fucking kick back? She want, why don't you kick back and fucking relax already? You already took your shirt off. You know what I mean? Let it go. That's when Johnny turns his aggressions on Enadina and told her, matter of fact, while he's taking off his shirt, why don't you get out of my mom's wheelchair? Enadina complied, but this just created more animosity. This is where things got heated. Enadina obviously felt disrespected, and she had every intention on doing something about it. She got up out of the wheelchair, and she told Bugs, she's like, you know what, let's just go, man. So they left from that area where they were at up on the balcony, and they went to an area that was closer to the entrance of the hotel. They knew that Cherio would be there any minute, so they posted up right there. So Cherio, he ends up pulling up a few minutes later. He pulls up, he gets out the car, and then he helps Enadina get in the car. Meanwhile, Johnny, apparently, he comes down the stairs and he continues to push. So Cherio, he has no idea that any of this had went on. He didn't know that, you know, they just got into a confrontation a few minutes earlier. All he knows is that he's there to pick up his, his you know, his niece and take her to the hospital. But as he's helping her get in the car, Johnny's still talking. That's when Cherio told Johnny to back up and show some respect. Furthermore, he warned Johnny that Enadina was his niece and that he was digging himself a deep hole. So after Chirio helped Enadina get into the front seat, he gets into the driver's seat. He tells Bugsy to get in the back and they start to drive away. Chirio then drove down the street about a half a block. He, drove, he drives about a half block down. He pulls over. He parks. He tells Enadina, hey, we'll be right back. And then he tells Bugsy, he's like, hey, let's go, bro. He's like, follow me real quick. So they jump out the car and they start walking back towards the Wilmington Inn. He's going to confront this cat and he's going to deal with it however however it goes. But while all this is going on, Psycho, he's kind of like just in the shadows, just kind of hanging back watching. He knows who Cherio is. He knows who the Grajadas are. And you know he knows that it's not a good thing to get involved in any kind of conflict with, with that family. But he just kind of fell back and he wasn't involved at that point. Even though Johnny is his wife Stella's son, he did time with Chirio, and he knew he wasn't someone to be fucked with. Psycho understood what was at stake, and he just hoped that things would kind of just diffuse themselves. But his concerns were more towards Johnny and his mental deficiencies. Johnny was considered to be special ed, so he didn't always handle these kind of situations properly. So eventually, Psycho walked out of their room and walked towards the front of the motel. He was hoping to get Johnny and bring him back upstairs so that he wouldn't make the situation any worse. But as Psycho got into closer proximity to where Cherio and Johnny were at, he overheard Cherio say, yeah, there's a lot of people running their mouths around here about shit. I am something. I will be back. So after the confrontation, I guess that's when a light bulb went off and Johnny realized that he fucked up. He goes back up to his mom's room and he tells both his mom, Stella, and Psycho, he's like, you know what? I think I just fucked up. Cherio, he's mad at me. He just left. Psycho already knew. He was standing there watching the whole confrontation. So Psycho tells Johnny, he's like, you know what? Just go down to the office and just post up. Just post up down there. Let everything cool off. And, you know, just kick it down there for a little bit. And I'll come down there and get you. Apparently, they were real close with the manager. The manager was somebody that allowed them to run around in that hotel and do, do what they wanted. And there was a little lounge area that was close by the manager's office where, you know, Johnny could go sit, watch TV, do whatever, whatever he was going to do to kill some time to just wait. So he went down there. He goes down there. He goes to the lounge area and he posts up, He takes out his cell phone, starts fucking around on his cell phone. But the timing throws Psycho off. Chirio's only been gone for about 10 minutes and he's smart enough to understand what happened. He's like, man. You know, he's only been gone 10 minutes and then he came back. So he kind of figures it out. He's like, you know what? He probably just went to the car, grabbed a, a strap, and now he can't. he's coming back. So he's worried now. Psycho comes down the stairs and he approaches Jarrio. And when he approaches Jarrio at first, Jarrio, he doesn't recognize him and he throws his hands up. He starts to square off with him. And Psycho's like, hey, 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 hold up, bro. He's like, hey, Jarrio, it's me. It's Psycho from 18th Street. 
He's like, remember, we did time over here, wherever they did time at. And then Chirio, he wrecked. He's like, oh, okay, what's up, bro? He's like, it was happening. And so they start talking. And Psycho is like, hey, man, you know, the incident that happened. And, you know, he's like, that's that's my stepson. You know, with all due respect, man, he's like, give him a pass. You know, he's like, the dude's a knucklehead. You know, he don't know no better, man. I'm asking you, man, can you, can you give him a pass? And Chirio, he assures him. He's like, yeah, man. He's like, it's all good. He's like, he just needs to watch, you know, watch his mouth, watch who the fuck he's talking to. And, you know, he's like, you know, he disrespected my niece as well. And Edema told me something about him telling her to get the fuck up out of a wheelchair or something. And that's when Psycho's like, he tells Chirio, he's like, hey, hey, Chirio, with all due respect, like last week, man, she had three wheelchairs sitting out in front of the room and somebody fucking took off with one of them. So, you know, he's probably worried about somebody else stealing them. That's the only reason why he said what he said to her. But again, you know, I apologize on behalf of him and I'll talk to him about it. But, you know, no disrespect intended. You know, is, is it good? And Chirio tells him, yeah, it's, 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 good. it's good, man. We're straight. So after the conversation, Chirio gets on his cell phone, you know, right there in front of Psycho. Like, he didn't even have the conversation with him. He gets on his cell phone. He talks to somebody. And he stands there and he just posts up. He's posted up and he's waiting. Chirio doesn't know that Johnny is in the office. He doesn't, he doesn't know that at this point. You know, he probably thinks that he's up in his mom Stella's room or he's in his room, but he doesn't know that he's posted up inside the manager's office right there where they're at. So about five minutes after Chirio makes the phone call, a black SUV pulls up and two individuals jump out. Peanut and Clever. Now Psycho is worried. Now he knows that there's gonna be there's gonna be problems, but there's nothing he can say. There's nothing he can say or do to make this situation go away. The wheels are already turning. They're already in motion. You know, by this time, if Chirio put the phone call out, he's obviously feeling some type of way and there's nothing that's going to change the situation. So he just kind of just, again, he falls back and waits to see what's going to happen. So when Peanut and Clever, you know, when they jump out of the SUV, they walk up to Chirio and, you know, they have words for a minute. They, they start talking to each other. And as they're talking... Peanut obviously knew who Johnny was, being that he was from Westside Weemus himself. He sees him sitting in the lounge area in the manager's office, and he points him out. He's like, hey, there he is right there. So that's when Chirio tells Bugsy, he's like, hey, open the door. The door is locked, but being that they live at the hotel, they live at that motel, he's got a key. So Chirio, he tells him, he's like, hey, go open up that door. Chirio, Peanut, and Clever. They walk in and they walk straight by the manager. The manager says, hey, can I help you? They ignore her. They don't say nothing to her. And they just make a beeline straight to where Johnny's sitting at. Johnny looks up. He sees him. But he just continues to do whatever he's doing on his phone. He acts like they're not even there. So when they walk up to him, Chirio, he tells Johnny, he's like, hey, get your ass outside. Come out and fight. But obviously, Johnny, Johnny's not going to fight. He don't want to fight. He breaks it down. He's like, hey, I'm not going to fight you. He's like, man, you know, he's like, if I disrespected somebody, you know, I apologize. He's like, you know, I'm not going to fight nobody. I don't want to fight. But Chirio got his mind made up. You disrespected my niece. You disrespected my niece's old man. You know what I mean? You disrespected me. So he's got in his mind, dude, you got to come out and you got to fight. Otherwise, we're going to drag you out. But again, Johnny says he doesn't want to fight. He doesn't want to fight. He's not getting up. And that's when Chirio, he bitch slaps him. He palm slaps, slaps the shit out of him. He palm slaps him and he tells him, bitch, I said, get your motherfucking ass outside. That's the magic word. When you're really trying to get somebody to fight, that's what you say. You call him a bitch. And it worked. When Chirio slapped Johnny and bitch slapped him, Johnny jumped up and he tried to swing on Chirio. What he was thinking, I don't know, maybe that was that, that mental deficiencies kicking in. But he tries to swing at Chirio, and then Peanut and Clever, they get on him. You guys already know what's coming next. So they're going in on Johnny. They're stomping him out. And at some point, Peanut reaches in his waistband, and he pulls out his strap. He pulls the strap out, and he shoots Johnny twice. Pow, pow. He shoots him, and all three of them turn around and run out. Chirio, Peanut, and Clever, all three of them run out. 
They get back in the, in the SUV and they drive. They take off. Psycho had fell back all the way back by, by some staircase. He was over there out the way. He didn't want nothing to do with that situation. When he seen Peanut and Clever drive up, he fell all the way back. But when he heard the gunshot, he ran over to the office area. And that's when he heard somebody say, hey, they just shot your kid. So according to my source, Johnny didn't die instantly. One bullet passed through a kidney in his spine. And the other bullet passed through his colon, his small bowel, and his liver. He died a few minutes later as a result of major blood loss. Later on, Chirillo, Peanut, and Clever, they all got arrested. I don't know how long they got arrested after the incident, but they all got arrested. And Peanut would end up picking up a 62 years to life sentence on this case. This is what sent them to prison for life. So not only did the manager that worked at the Wilmington Inn testify against Peanut, but Johnny's wife, Melissa Garcia, also testified. Psycho from 18th Street ended up testifying. And Renee Enriquez, boxer from Articia, ended up testifying. They brought him in as an expert witness. You know, they probably figured this is one of the Grajadas. We want to bring out the big guns. And that's what they did. They brought Renee Enriquez in to testify against him. And he was the one that put the nail in his coffin. The moral of the story, respect amongst members of these criminal organizations is everything. And when it's not afforded, it's taken very serious. Obviously, these guys play by a different set of rules. People in society also demand to be shown a level of respect, but it's not predicated on these terms. If a civilian is disrespected out there, it might escalate to fisticuffs and possibly even more. But that's the exception, not the rule. Members of these organizations are more than willing to take someone's life and risk a life sentence when respect is forsaken. And that's what you're taught. If you're disrespected, it warrants a death sentence. Should you be willing to kill someone if they don't show you the type of respect that you think you deserve? Does it mean you're a coward if you don't take it to these extremes? When you don't value life, everything else is fair game. Again, respect in these criminal organizations takes precedence over everything else. The status mobility system is predicated on this right there. How far should you take it if somebody verbally disrespects you? Let me know what you think in the comments. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I know it's a short one, but it's one that I wanted to get out to you guys tonight. I'm going to try to get a second one out. We'll see what happens. I don't know if I'm going to have enough time. This one took a lot longer than I anticipated something else happened midway through, but it is what it is. At least I got one out for you guys, if nothing else. Try to get the other ones out tomorrow. Anyways, with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed your weekend. I hope your team won because mine didn't. With that being said, this your boy B, and I'm out. <laughs>